Welcome to uh, KC, which is Collaborative Assistance for the Society. This is the second uh, edition we are having, um, and we are going to have it in two phases. Uh, the first phase is today, where we are going to launch a contest of for building collaborative assistance. Collaborative assistance, just by the sheer word, uh, we mean uh, things which are in hardware, in software, they can be embedded rooms, they can be robots. Uh, all kinds of things which are basically automated systems which are can help you and collaborate with you in completing new tasks. Okay, so we may refer to them by just chatbots, but you may you have to kind of uh, bear this in mind that this is not just simple chit chat conversation. It could be this room. It could be the Alexa which is out there, which might be recording, but we want to show some demos also. That's why it is here. So we will be launching a contest and we'll talk about that. The second is we will give a few uh, demos of uh, things which the team here has been working on. And then we will have a panel which will be talking about how do you build trust in these collaborative assistants. Okay. Uh, so this is a short uh, event today, uh, three hours. And then we will follow this with a second edition, which will be on February 11th, again a Friday. Uh, and where we will end the contest. Uh, we will have some talks based on, on scientific talks and research topics and technology, and then we will probably have another panel. So we're just thinking about it, but uh, uh, put this in your calendar. So what do we do in KC? So just to give a sense of that, I'm talking about the first KC which we had. Uh, this was on October 16th, 2021, and uh, th this was uh, funded by uh, AI Journal and uh, AAAS, which is the American Association for Advancement of Sciences, Leshner Fellowship. Uh, and this is a fellowship which I got uh, in 2021, uh, which is to promote uh, AI uh, among people. So in that particular event, we had a panel, we had talks, uh, and it was about uh, collaborative assistance, the science of uh, how do you build chatbots and things like that. Uh, some panel about uh, how the technology world is looking at it from Amazon, from um, Google and so on. What are the, uh, the technology product side people are looking at it and the potential for South Carolina. So I'm very uh, concerned about not just talking about, uh, you know, uh, chatbots and all that, but all they're doing is uh, giving coupons. Okay. Or they're trying to sell you the next product. That's okay, but that's not solving any critical problem. So how do you solve problems of the region? Okay. So uh, we started the day with a tutorial. Uh, we had uh, uh, a, a professional trainer come over and talk about how chatbots are built. Uh, then we had our uh, uh, dean talk, uh, and today he was not available, but he would have loved to be here, but he inaugurated KC uh, first time. Then a uh, number of my colleagues uh, uh, at uh, Triple H uh, Leshner Fellows, uh, they joined and they talked about during COVID, how they were looking at AI impacting the things, uh, or you can see many of the, them are uh, uh, academics. Most of them are academics from the uh, different universities. And uh, Triple S, uh, we had uh, Emily uh, introduce us. Then we had uh, the science of building chatbots. We had people from World Economic Forum and uh, from uh, IBM and Amazon uh, talk about uh, what are some of the next steps that they're looking at from a technology point of view. Uh, we had a panel uh, with people from Google, Accenture, and uh, our own Joey uh, talk about how his experience was and uh, Brian uh, and, and IBM uh, talk about uh, on the product side, how they are looking at uh, chatbots and uh, these systems getting built. And then we had the panel uh, talking about uh, uh, how we actually solve problems uh, in the local area. So we had Daisy uh, last time uh, and uh, from uh, folks from nursing and from education and uh, uh, Brandt uh, talk about uh, regional problems from law perspective, from nursing and so on, okay? So with that kind of a background, we were thinking what can we do this time around, okay? So today's program is broken down into uh, we said, let's get the students involved. So that's why let's have some chatbot competition. Okay. And uh, we will have uh, uh, Chi and Kaushik talk about what this is in a little while. But that was uh, the, the first thing that we have today. 
The second thing which we have is uh, we will be showing some demos of uh, systems which people have been building. Uh, this would be uh, broadly in the areas of education, uh, health, and uh, networked environment. And one interesting thing is that these are not just the demos which uh, we are building in the lab, but we are building with our partners, with our startups, with various other companies. So we are co-developing with the various stakeholders. Okay, so people are caring about these systems, not just something we are building just in the lab. And then we will be having a panel uh, uh, where we will be talking about, uh, we have uh, Laura from a robotics point of view, we have Mira uh, talking from health perspective and mental health, how these technologies can be helpful. And uh, Brandt again, he will be joining uh, uh, online and, uh, uh, and Amit uh, representing the lab. Okay, so I'll be the moderator. So <coughs> this, none of this can be possible without uh, organizers. And I'm very thankful to Chi uh, for helping us on the competition side of things and uh, uh, Utkarshini, Manas, Vishal, uh, Teja, and Pashe in helping putting all this together. So with this, I'll invite uh, Amit to give some uh, opening words and then we'll start with the competition. So delighted that um, uh, you all here. What is exciting is um, this is the first event that we're holding in this room. First official event that we're holding in this room. We had, a, I think, a lecture or so, but not really. Um, so you guys are here helping us inaugurate this wonderful facility in that sense. Um, if it was not COVID, I would uh, expect that we would have something other every week here. Um, the so. One significance of this event is that um, the AI Institute needs, uh, you know, decided, you know, we decided as we started the AI Institute that it's not going to be a, an isolated academic um, place where people will do some research, publish it, and go on. That we would be working to, um, uh, towards making impact in various ways. And making impact means working with um, broad variety of people, uh, stakeholders, customers, users. And um, so the core philosophy of AI Institute has been to simultaneously do foundational research in AI, uh, where we can say we are doing among the best uh, work in the world, as well as do translational research, which, is, um, which encompasses the entire campus of this uh, R1 university. And, um, and then broadly beyond the campus to engage uh, the region and, and the state. And it has been just two years uh, since we started this institute. Uh, official institute was started in July 1, but the uh, first group of uh, people who moved from my prior center to this institute uh, came at the start of the fall in 2019. So um, we, uh, uh, and, and since then, uh, we made several choices and decisions that um, are very strategically guided. So for example, um, just pay attention to who is the first faculty that we hired uh, to join us. That was Biplo. And it was partly because um, uh, he came from industry. He also wanted to do this translational uh, uh, work uh, that had impact. And, um, he, of course, worked on also a chosen area of uh, emphasis. So from the very beginning in the leadership talk I gave when I was invited to, before even I had a formal offer, I had, uh, for example, uh, the uh, virtual assistant as one of the core area for our growth. Uh, so it is one of the five areas of growth. Uh, Biplo fit into all of those boxes. And um, uh, with that, then, you know, we started further building on, on, on uh, since then also we have continued to make uh, similar choices. Uh, I think the uh, second person hired was Forrest. Um, he fits in very well with um, the strategy where he's interested in education, uh, various engineering disciplines, very well engaged with the students and such. <coughs> and um, there was an area in which uh, uh, that is also attractive us from, from AI perspective, reinforcement learning. So he and uh, the next person we hired, Chi, they also brought in significant expertise in that area. Um, 
with that, um, uh, and, and, and Diplo and I do natural language processing that is there um, and, and natural language understanding and natural language generation. And these, these are all important things that are part of actually building collaborative assistance or building a virtual assistant, uh, where um, uh, the assistant have to understand what uh, a user speaks to the assistant, but assistant also has to generate a, a question that is meaningful. Uh, as a follow-up to engage the um, you know participant, to engage the user. So um, uh, the, in that sense, you know, again, she fit in very well. Uh, beyond that, then um, I felt that um, uh, we also have to take a short. You know, um, th there was a unique opportunity in in some sense. So there's both push and pull, and um, um, from a strategic perspective. Um, I always been interested in brain inspired computing, human brain, and how, uh, how do you make machines intelligent? So understanding uh, neuroscience and cognitive science and behavior economics, these were been important areas uh, so that we are positioned uh, to make big impact in the, as the AI transforms, you know, it's not, uh, AI is now entering so-called third phase of AI. The first phase was AI, um, in, in, you know, uh, last century, uh, I, I had a project in 19, late 1980s funded by DARPA uh, on AI. Um, uh, and uh, so, I, you know, that was of integrating AI with uh, large databases and uh, doing uh, some reason inferencing. Um, then this century, for the first 20 years, AI has become, uh, you know, the second phase of AI is something called statistical AI, uh, where, um, AI has tried to benefit from analyzing very large amount of data and being able to you know, harvest the label of the data to train a system more automatically rather than human manually giving rules as in the first phase, here you can learn from the data and um, training that you can give the system. Now we are entering this third phase so-called neurosymbolic computing, hybrid AI um, or AI which can explain and which combines uh, you know, the statistical and symbolic part of the AI. We um, have a very long history of uh, a part of the area in work called knowledge representation. Uh, so how do you capture the knowledge that humans have collectively developed, like in medical context, um, UMLS. So many people have developed, you know, work together to develop UMLS, you know, vocabularies. So how do you leverage that in making the machines intelligent? And so we are, we have positioned ourselves um, to play important role. Uh, a, an area that we already started to know for is called knowledge infused learning. And basically this is about how do you take knowledge such as the knowledge a uh, human expert might have, the knowledge as an expert in mental health that Mira would have, okay? Dr. Nasiman would have. How would you know, uh, uh, benefit from that? And how do you make uh, the AI system smarter that benefits from the knowledge that human, humans have. Um, the, uh, in the back, there is a, uh, a, you know, a person, Rakshit, um, uh, he's sitting, uh, he's just a, he just joined us new as a, uh, recently as a master student, but he's been working for 10 years in a company that I co-founded called EZDI, which by the way, just had an exit, was purchased by a very large company. Um, and in that, we develop a very large knowledge graph for, um, for, for, healthcare and use that knowledge graph to improve natural language processes. And so there uh, we also, you know, there's a company has a patent uh, on how do you use knowledge graphs for clinical NLP <coughs> and, um, uh, you know, results to show for that. So products for the company uh, called computerized uh, document improvement, computerized uh, coding are deployed at some of the largest uh, hospitals uh, in, in the nation. And um, now, as we see, um, you know, AI um, uh, progressing towards this third phase, explainable AI, trustworthy AI, again, Diplo works in the area of trust. Um, uh, uh, several of others, uh, including myself, work on the explainability aspects of the AI. And that is, by the way, an important attribute of knowledge infused learning. So we have positioned ourselves uh, to uh, have, uh, you know, significant play in selective areas, which I think would be growth area for the, um, uh, for the AI. 
Now, looking at the outer circle, uh, I'm very proud to say that in, again, this short time, we have executed on this fantastically. We have joined projects already with more than 10 colleges and schools, right? So we have School of Medicine, School of Nursing, School of Public Health, um, high school, pharmacy, uh, uh, arts and science, and, and so on with all of these uh, colleges uh, on our campus, we already have joint project. Um, uh, so my, I'm forgetting our own college, smart manufacturing with electrical engineering and such. It just so happens that among all of these uh, roughly 20 or so projects, these are all funded <laughs> projects of which about 10 are uh, externally funded project from NSF and NIH. That's pretty large number in such a short time, and most of them in just this past year. That um, uh, area that stands out is this area of uh, uh, the topic, uh, it belongs to the topic that we, have, we are here for today. So um, uh, we have, um, with the College of Medicine, I think three or four um, uh, virtual assistance being done, mental health, uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes for type 1 diabetes for children um, and, and something i'm forgetting uh, will be we'll have um, uh, mental health uh, so we have we are look, looking into autism related for parents also uh, we have uh, what we are working with nursing and, and 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 others that i'm not going to all you know talk about uh, in detail so with that um, uh, this workshop uh, you know the kc year brings us together where so many of our students are involved, so many faculty are involved, so many of our collaborators are involved. And I'm particularly thrilled that Diplo thought about, you know, having this uh, uh, second uh, KC in two phases. And this, and, and that I loved the fact that he chose to focus on, you know, saying, what are we doing for uh, our state? What are, what are we doing locally? And then we'll talk about things broadly. So with that, Thank you, Amit. Uh, so I'd like to call upon uh, Chi and Kaushik to talk about uh, the contest, please. Hi, everyone. So <clears throat> I'm Chi, uh, a faculty member at EI Institute. And as Bipla introduced, um, this year we have a very exciting contacts, which aims to bring uh, bringing more involvement and in, in, uh, 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 participation from the student, which is this uh, chatbot or collaborative assistant uh, building context. And, and uh, so you can find the, all the information, the details um, in this website. The way you get into this website is by first clicking uh, the KC 2.0, and then within that, you'll find the contest uh, subpage, and you will you know, get all the information listed here. It's going to be a very serious contact because we are proud to offer prizes to the to, to the winners. It's, it's, we'll we'll uh, give the first uh, prize as uh, two fifty dollars, um, and the uh, submission uh, guidelines is also uh, listed uh, here. We have an optional uh, submission, uh, which is due November fifteenth. About a month from now. The point is that you want to submit your uh, your team information alongside with uh, some idea about what you want to do. Um, it's optional, but it's it's very encouraged because it gives us a rough understanding of what we are about to evaluate uh, at the end of the contest. And the final submission is due uh, the end of January uh, next year. Um, and and uh, I think the, uh, the phase two of KC 2.0, we will announce uh, the, the winners. That's roughly the logistic uh, about this, this context. Um, for the details about what we are going to care about, how we are going to evaluate, I will hand, hand that in to, to Kashik to explain it a little bit more. So the uh, <clears throat> subject of the competition is to build collaborative uh, okay. So the subject of the contest is to build uh, collaborative assistance. 
that are somehow impactful to uh, society and um, also to the state of South Carolina. Um, so some examples of um, problem ideas are written here. Um, health, for example, uh, public safety, which community is unsafe for children because people may come here looking for uh, schools and where to settle down and things. So <clears throat> with respect to that, uh, you can solve problems related to water and gardening. These are just problem ideas to uh, uh, illustrate the idea of uh, the, th the theme of this contest, but um, you can choose any uh, idea that that solves a problem of high impact in South Carolina. These are some of the data sets uh, that you can use. Uh, these are all open publicly available data sets and they're directly helpful in some of the problem ideas that have been, that are that are listed here. And so <clears throat> now moving on to how we'll evaluate the problem. Uh, broadly we'll evaluate in terms of uh, the uh, how many people the problem reaches so in uh, South Carolina or outside how many people will be impacted by the solution to this problem um, how user friendly is the uh, assistant to use uh, personalization so different groups of people and individuals they have their own needs so how is the collaborative assistant tailored towards everyone's personalized needs and uh, context awareness so uh, oftentimes the collaborative assistant is trying to solve too big a problem and uh, we'd like to see how the collaborative assistant is able to contextualize with respect to the specific uh, problem that it's trying to solve so um, yeah that's all i have to say so um, we're looking forward to all the submissions so moving on, uh, we are uh, talking about the demos. So I'll call upon Manas to uh, introduce the demos uh, that we have, as well as uh, the demo participants, right? And you can just think about the modality. So we'll asking each of the presenters to join yeah. into the Zoom and share. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So next in the subsequent call of uh, KC, which will happen in February, we'll have more demos, I would say, as more people submit their uh, chatbots or their uh, conversational assistants. For now, uh, in this uh, meeting of KC, we will be focusing on uh, uh, chatbots that have been built along the idea of uh, education, mental health, and network management. Uh, they are, and also there is a one interesting chatbot which I liked, which is at the intersection of education and games. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we uh, so every presenter will have like uh, one to two minutes pitch and followed by a demo, and uh, which will roughly comprise of like six to seven minutes, and then a five minutes for question answer. So roughly every presenters will have twelve minutes in total for the uh, for their present uh, for their uh, section in the presentation. So, and uh, feel free, you can actually come over here and present, or you can present uh, by sharing your screen from the Zoom. So, uh, we move forward. Our first presenter would be uh, is uh, Vedant, uh, who will be sh uh, showing the uh, uh, chatbot, which is at the intersection of education and games. And uh, it's a pretty interesting one, which uh, brings together how uh, students can be taught uh, uh, how to learn and solve a Rubik's Cube. Hello everyone. So today I'm here to present our work, Alios, a multimodal guided environment for helping children learn to solve a Rubik's cube with automatic solving and interactive explanations. Since years, AI algorithms have been giving optimal solutions to various problems, such as AlphaGo, Rubik's cube, chess, and so on. But what we want to do is we want to use these powerful AI algorithms and educate uh, humans to ha learn how to solve these problems. Often, oftentimes, the solution, the optimal solution given by these AI algorithms are not uh, understandable by humans. So here in this work, what we do is we, we would like to simplify the algorithm so that it is understandable to humans. And we also have a collaborative setting which uh, 
collaborative setting between the AI system and the end users, which gives out solutions tailored to end user experience. And it also allows the end user to bring, bring in their own solutions, different strategies, which can be uh, verified using our system. So today, uh, the video, the video which uh, I'll be playing is about a uh, preliminary work of our project and its prototype allure, which seeks to address the gap and the role that today's AI technology can play in educating, uh, educating humans using a Rubik's cube uh, use case. And an explainable module that uses inductive logic programming. <coughs> it also has an interactive chatbot built with the Rasa platform and keeps track of users' learning goals and progress. On the left hand side of the screen, we can see the model of our Rubik's Cube. And on the right hand side, we have our chatbot Allure. The bot will teach us how to solve the white cross for the given scrambled state of the cube. Before moving on to solve the cube, Allure teaches us all the basic dimensions of the cube. Each 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube has three horizontal layers, top, middle, and bottom layer. While teaching various conventions, it also asks for user feedback. In this case, as we do not have any questions, we choose no. Each flat surface of the cube is considered a face, and each face is a different color, hence consisting of six faces with six different colors. White, red, blue, green, orange, and yellow. Along with different faces, it has three different types of pieces. Centerpiece, edge piece, and corner piece. Centerpieces are single colored tiles fixed to the internal core. When correctly solved, each face will be the color of its centerpiece. Edge pieces have two colored tiles, and on a 3x3 three three cube, there are 12 of them. The corner pieces have three colored tiles, and there are eight of them on a 3x3 three three cube. Each different cube face is represented by a letter, and those letters are used to define the clockwise and counterclockwise groups for those faces. The faces and their corresponding letter representations are Q for the up face and D for the down face. L for the left face and R for the right face, F for the front face and B for the back face. For clockwise moves, we just use the letter representation for the face that should move. For example, if one wanted to turn the front face clockwise, that would be represented at F. For clockwise moves, we use the letter representation with an F and apostrophe for the face that should move. Following the previous example, if one wanted to move the Face counterclockwise, blue would get F dash or F prime. After completing the basics of the Rubik's Cube, now the user asks the bot to teach it how to solve the Rubik's Cube. Solving a Rubik's Cube consists of various sub goals. The sub goal we'll be solving in this demo is the white cross, which involves getting a white orange, white green, white red white blue edge pieces in place. To get one of these edge pieces in place, the white side of the edge piece has to be aligned with the white center piece, and the color side of the edge piece would align with the same colored center piece. For example, to align the white green edge piece, the white edge would align with the white center piece, and the green edge would align with the green center piece. At the end of the sub goal, there would be a white cross on the up face, and the center piece of the orange, green, red, the blue faces will have the same color tile directly above it. Let us solve the problem. Here is the initial state, and here is where we want to be, our goal state. We can automatically solve it. But how did the system figure it out? The system can explain. In the given configuration, we can see that the white orange edge piece is not in place, as the white side is aligned with the orange center piece and the orange side is aligned with the yellow center piece. 
To get the edge piece in place, we need to first align the edge piece away from the orange center piece by turning the down face counterclockwise. Now we want to align the orange side of the edge piece with the orange center piece by turning the front face counterclockwise. Further, we want to bring the white orange edge piece in place by turning the right face clockwise. Finally, we bring the white green edge piece in place by turning the front face clockwise. We have now solved the white cross for the Rubik's Cube. Here's another example of a lore solving a scrambled Rubik's Cube for white cross. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so that's that's where the collaborative uh, system between the so collaborative part between AI system and the end user comes in place. So that's what we are trying to do with the UI part that the user, if he plans to try out his own strategies, he can input those strategies by using natural language or just using the virtual cube, the 3D modeling, which we just saw in the video. And then if there is an ambiguity in its solution, the system will convey that to the user. Okay. Oh, okay. Hmm. Any questions? Great. Thanks, Thank you. So, um, the next uh, presentation will be uh, by Kaushik, and uh, he will be presenting about a mental health chatbot, uh, which we uh, uh, thought about would be interesting because it's it's the first of its kind that utilizes process knowledge that uh, clinicians use in their clinical settings as well as it's a safety constraint because it's guided by some some questionnaires so it's a, a interesting prototype of how uh, the questionnaires that clinicians use actually come up uh, come up live as a flow chart as an algorithmic flow chart that you can utilize to train and guide your uh, conversational assistants i give the stage to kaushik um so <clears throat> Things that are involved in in a self self management strategy for a patient is um, uh, during their therapist visits, uh, the therapist writes down guidelines uh, for the patient to follow, and plus when <clears throat> they are uh, talking to the patient, they're using a lot of knowledge about any disease that they might have. For example, uh, relevant knowledge related to uh, understanding a patient's anxiety condition is. A questionnaire called the General Anxiety Disorder Seven, and um, there are seven questions that help them understand the patient's anxiety condition. And similarly, with respect to more extreme conditions, there there are other kinds of skills. So a chatbot that can use such knowledge to uh, try to help the patient manage themselves, while at the same time helping them adhere to the guidelines already prescribed, uh, is the goal for this project. Okay, so here is an example of the questionnaire. Um, these are the seven aspects that uh, talk about a pa uh, the patient's anxiety condition. So let's say uh, these, the highlights in green are the conditions that the bot can already glean from a document called the discharge summary. So uh, when the patient is discharged, the therapist writes a, um, a document uh, summarizing the patient's condition and the chatbot can already uh, process information in that document. And so if sometimes the information is clear enough that it has answers to some of these questions, sometimes it has partial answers. That's the highlight uh, of not being able to stop or control volume. So, and sometimes it has no information. The non-highlighted aspect is where it has no information from the discharge summary. So, now 
when it needs to gather information about uh, the thing that it has partial information on, um, what we use is um, what, what we're calling process knowledge, which is that there's a particular order in which um, a clinician asks questions um, to elaborate on that particular aspect. So <clears throat> Dr. Hartman, we have with us here today, helped us uh, create this data set um, to uh, elaborate on aspects of uh, the general anxiety disorder. So the bot uses this knowledge to ask questions. So the bot also provides a, um, a, a, a contains an internal explanation as to why it asks this question. So we see here uh, something called the question probability. So this uh, question is generated by a neural network. And so uh, the neural network has uh, some internal score of why it has generated that question uh, uh, computed as a probability. And that's the first part, but that's not entirely very useful to people other than computer scientists. So um, there's also other scores associated with this generated text. Uh, the second thing you see there is which, uh, what rank does uh, this question uh, pertain to with respect to those elaboration questions? So it's asking about uh, how likely do you feel this way? And you can see on the right panel that that's the second question in the um, process knowledge. So that's, uh, provides more explanation as to why the bot generated this particular sentence. And then there is validity. The validity score means that aspects of the question are actually related to anxiety disorder, like nervousness. The reason that that score is one right now is because uh, the word nervous uh, and um, the concept of nervousness is related in that sentence is related to anxiety disorder. And there's one such concept in this sentence. Uh, the safety score relates to um, the question having no uh, trigger words in it. So that's why the uh, uh, number there is zero. So similarly, the bot continues conversation uh, using that uh, process knowledge. So once it's uh, finished gathering information, the part in white is no longer white because now it has uh, information about this patient's feeling nervous, anxious, or not. So now that's highlighted in green. Okay. Another thing is that um, sometimes the patient may utter things that are indicative of um, extreme um, mental illness thought patterns. So one such uh, flowchart that helps us uh, assess this is the Columbia Suicide oh. Severity Rating Scale. Uh, it can uh, help the AI algorithm understand through a flowchart, a decision flowchart of questions, uh, the suicidal thought pattern for a patient. So in this chatbot, we just don't deal with this kind of extreme mental illness. But nonetheless, we'll have to detect if there, uh, if this patient has aspects of suicidal thoughts. So, <clears throat> now, now what the bot does is that it detects that this person is having suicidal ideation, and it shows also in the decision flowchart. Uh, how it identified this this patient has suicidal ideation. No. 
Because our this seems here where we need to work more, you know, in fact, with the new and previous clinicians and research and expertise because um, we think we can certainly do better than, you know, uh, the phone line that says, you know, if there are emergency call and I know anyone. But I think, nevertheless, um, for the risk where we do not recognize what do we do about it. That's like essentially for a liability issue, right? Yeah. So when, when the chatbot says, uh, or when the human says something like this, the patient says something to the chatbot, yeah. and says, actually, I'm trying to, you know, kill myself, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. Where does that kind of, you know, really kind of, how, do you, how does that then activate or alert the provider? Right. So figuring out those interfaces is important. Right. <clears throat> so here, one, one of those fail-safe actions can be to just contact the, an emergency hotline. Now, uh, as mentioned before, that there are already guidelines that this patient has to uh, follow. You already summarized during the previous visit. And so uh, one other functionality of the chatbot is just to um, remind the patient of those um, medication that they're supposed to take. And then now uh, the patient may not remember exactly the uh, specifications of the medication. So the chatbot can use external knowledge graphs and knowledge bases to tell the patient exactly what is the dosage and what frequencies should they be taking it to. As a final thing, um, sometimes the patient just wants to uh, vent. Uh, they don't really show the uh, mechanism for the personalization here. Uh, personalization, no, no, not in this one. No. So the chatbot also has a uh, particular act which uh, just engages in conversation with the patient without actually trying to detect any mental health pattern or uh, any suggest any medication remind. So thank you. Th these are the things that are currently implemented in the chatbot, but uh, there's more coming, like Dr. Seth mentioned, um, personalization. So for example, somebody's uh, uh, mental health pattern, let's say depression can be caused due to a wide variety of reasons and identifying exactly what their reason could be. For example, it could be because of body image issues like body dysmorphic disorder. It could be because of some bipolar disorder. It could be because of milder conditions like work stress or something. So uh, th those are personalized aspects that are being um, developed. Thanks, Pashik. So we move to the third presentation uh, from Kosik. And it's on Reserve Bot, which is a conversational bot for uh, resource optimization and network management. So our main aim here is to uh, build a robust conversational agent uh, in manage to manage network environments for the users. So the novelties of our conversational agent, uh, in contrast to the existing work in the domain. Uh, like can be categorized into two different categories. One will be the, at the dialogue level and the other one will be at the system level. So at dialogue level, uh, we are bringing uh, use of natural interaction uh, through voice commands and uh, for user subgroups, uh, like performing parental control and other uh, uh, network uh, management uh, functions. And also use of multi-speaker authentication using voice control where multiple speakers uh, can speak at the same time and it gets authenticated and they can just uh, use their access their personal accounts, uh, which is a robust way of authenticating the users. And also uh, there is support for uh, uh, different language variants. Uh, uh, right now uh, we are uh, building uh, th the same chatbot in the Japanese uh, language as well. And also there is expedited user onboarding. So a faster user onboarding. And if you look at the system level, uh, we are using uh, small data. Uh, it, so we are using a, a RASA framework. Uh, we used RASA framework to build the chatbot and uh, we used uh, small data and it has the natural language understanding capabilities. And we, have we are also generating uh, uh, intense and more training data using uh, GPT-3 and GANs. So 
uh, and also we perform uh, with real time considerations and also optimize networking resources when desired. So whenever the user wants to maybe change the bandwidth, give priority to a particular user in an environment uh, like a home or an office, they can do it. And also we have a robust pipeline uh, by pipeline, I mean, in the conversational agent that we built and uh, yeah, multiple technology options. Uh, so the business value is, so we, so this can be controlled uh, in a networked environment like home and uh, using like natural interaction through voice and gesture. And uh, uh, there is a, there will be an improved system management uh, like the networking and also will be, we can bootstrap without the data uh, like using a dialogue uh, to learn and customize the response immediately. And also it interrupts interoperates with multiple chatbot platforms. Uh, so right now it is on Alexa and also are planning to integrate it with Google Home as well. So this is like a diagram of uh, like the work uh, control flow diagram of the system uh, where when the user uh, says a query, uh, something like give priority to a particular user in that uh, in the home or office. Uh, there will be a natural language uh, pipeline, as you can see uh, in the dialogue system that we used and the data uh, on which it is trained on uh, is uh, some of it is human annotated and also we are using uh, data, we will be using data uh, from GPT-3 uh, and also GANs. Uh, so the orchestrator uh, here takes, gives the control to the appropriate block based on the user query and uh, there is the network manager, uh, which provides the user with uh, different analytics. Uh, like say, if you ask the chatbot, um, how, how, how much time did I spend on a particular app last week or something, it will be able to tell it. And there is also the optimization block, uh, which is responsible for network optimization. Uh, like uh, if you want to change the bandwidth of or give priority to a user, uh, the control goes to the optimization block and the executor finally executes this action and uh, uh, the orchestrator also has the access to the database yeah, so, so whenever needed. So in your home setting, if you have a meeting and your children are playing games, right, you can say, uh, shut down these children and let me have my meeting. So that's the thing we are trying to do. Or in this room, right, we are having this meeting and someone else is uh, watching the sports matches, right, we can control that. So that's the idea. <laughs> so we have... Uh, Shut down your children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, it's so simple. So we are building this system uh, in collaboration with a company called Tanto4. Uh, some folks from Tanto4, uh, they have been working in this uh, IoT area uh, and uh, we started working with them like in last December. And we are like building more and more. So that's the brief introduction and uh, I can move to the demo uh, yeah. from the Alexa base. Uh, Alexa. Yeah. Alexa, start Reserve Board. Hello, welcome to Reason. How may I help you? What queries can you perform? All right. Reason Board supports 27 different queries. Some of the main features are dash one, parental control two, priority control three, tracking all users and devices online. Is there anything else that I can help you with today? Can you uh, tell me uh, how many devices are connected to this particular router? There are zero devices online. Do you need help with anything else? Can you run the speed test? Your download speed is 226.79 megabits per second and upload speed is 5.79 megabits per second. Anything else? How to use parental control and reserve? 
shown. The parental control option can be used for pausing internet for individual users, setting app filters, locking unblocking applications for a particular user, setting time limits on a particular user or an application for that user. Anything else I can help you with? Can you tell me how much time did I spend on YouTube last week? The total time usage for YouTube during last week was 3,495 seconds. Is there anything else that I can help you with today? No, thank you. Goodbye and have a nice day. So that is the deep demo. So the interesting thing about uh, the last query that I asked, uh, can you tell me like how much time did I spend on YouTube last week? Or if I ask it uh, something like, uh, how much data did I download from a particular application last week? So we have implemented a system which converts natural language to query, uh, like a MySQL query, and from MySQL query, it will fetch the data from the uh, tables or like the database that they have at the backend. So that was the direct implementation of it. So we are building, a, we built a rule-based uh, natural language to SQL, natural language to uh, SQL uh, this thing system. And uh, soon we are planning to build a more learning-based one uh, based on the data. Uh, so if anyone has any questions. Kaushik, this is Pankesh. Hi, Pankesh. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to know the technology stack for the implementation. What is the technology stack? Uh, you mean the technology that we used uh, to build the conversational agent? Yes, yes. So we used uh, Rasa framework uh, to build the conversational agent. So we have uh, human annotated data. We still did not uh, include the data that we generated from GPT-3. Uh, that is like a future work that we are planning to do soon. Uh, but yeah, the framework that we used was uh, Rasa and we integrated it with uh, the Alexa device for now. Okay. So I'm just wondering because uh, there are, uh, I mean, Alexa is a one one part, but in background, if you connect it with uh, Lambda and serverless architecture, some of the services can be implemented uh, 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 very quickly by leveraging some of the AWS uh, architecture component as well. So, I mean, again, this is just a small uh, minor thoughts that might be, it might be useful if you could leverage uh, AWS Lambda integration with the Alexa services, because by that way, you will have a flexibility to scale your solutions in multiple language, uh, multiple NLP query as well, because Alexa and uh, Lambda come up with their, some of the very nice uh, uh, services also. So, I mean, just the thoughts that might be good to kind of, you could explore or may have may, you may have uh, some technology feasible uh, feasibility of aws alexa integration with lambda and some of the aws services as well yeah so pankesh one very big consideration uh, is that we want to use open source rasa is open source okay and uh, uh, you can always tie in into one platform infrastructure and do a little bit better as you were saying the amazon in ecosystem similarly google has its own ecosystem the thing is we want to be especially you know have the flexibility and that was one of the things so what happens is when we are supporting multiple languages right many of these providers are very poor uh, so amazon is not very good in japanese for example okay and we want to support hindi so i'm actually quite impressed with the hindi support that alexa has and uh, maybe telugu and any other languages right we want to have that flexibility so multi-language support we are going really after and open uh, multiple languages, right? So this is an interesting thing. Um, uh, your, your point is very well taken. And uh, the, uh, but the thing is, we are trying to be as much as possible platform agnostic. And again, we are pushing the research side of things. So integration we are doing, but I think at the back end, how we can flex, we like the NLQ that uh, Kaushik was talking about, right? That's like really, really the cutting edge we are trying at this time. Okay, but Lambda function, uh, again, just a small notes, Lambda functions will give you the flexibility to write your code in your own language as well. It could be a Python, JavaScript, so whatever the code, for example, as a part the of- Developers don't matter. Can... So Pankesh, again, 
language here is Japanese, Telugu, and this one. It's not Python and Java, please. <laughs> Let's get out of the computer science. And also, I'd like to add uh, something else. So, uh, uh, so I think Vinamra is also on the call. So he he's the one who's building the chatbot in Japanese as well. Uh, so he has uh, trained the bot. He has built a tokenizer in uh, Japanese, and uh, also some training data. And uh, yeah, soon we'll have the chatbot and working in Japanese as well. And we are planning to have more uh, languages, as Professor Dipla has mentioned. So I will also like to mention one more thing, which is uh, when we look at South Carolina and, and these regions, right? What I've realized is that there is not a whole lot of things which are happening in African American vernacular, vernacular English. Okay. So there are different languages, there are different dialects and the, the usage of these devices are pathetic as soon as you have accents and many of these variations, right? So it, it actually prevents people from using it. I don't like Alexa. I mean, frankly, before this project, I never liked Alexa and any of these devices because they cannot take my Indian accent. Okay. And, I'm, I, and, and if um, I, as a person knowing the technology, they don't like it, then people who are just uh, buying it, right. Uh, after the sports matches or whatever, right. Whether they don't use any of these devices. So the thing is, how do we actually make it and bring trust of these people? Right. That's very important. So Pankish, your point is very well taken. So first, uh, Thanks for the comment. I'm just kind of trying to tell you that uh, some of the considerations we are trying to build in is to be open source, to go for uh, low resource languages, okay? And mixed languages. So Hindi, English, Japanese, Hindi, uh, sorry, Japanese, English, right? And uh, AV is a very important thing for support in, uh, um, in various regions, right? Especially in developing regions, even in, within the US. I just want to highlight that point. So working with very little uh, data is a very important thing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bebla. Does this have any applicability for healthcare? I'm just curious. We could definitely do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, this one is targeted towards uh, network management, as I was telling you. Uh, but uh, the underlying kind of the technology we are using, right, uh, like auto-generating intent and so on, can definitely be targeted towards uh, healthcare and these things. The thing which uh, uh, which uh, is different is how do you validate test it, right? Right. That's a big big consideration. Here I just did the speed test and it's good and <laughs> ship it off. So right now, right now, what we got is directly from the backend, like from the database, it just access the second one, but we, we can like change it. Yeah, 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 we will we'll change it. So they have a more a huge customer base there in Japan as well for the company that has bought. So they are aiming for, for that as well. So international company, uh, this just as a nature of things, right? Uh, the first language that is supported is English, then Japanese, Japan, and then comes your Spanish and French. Just in the order of the market side. No, no, no other specific. That's what people try to go after. So uh, we move to the next presentation. Uh, it's by from Prashant. Uh, he, uh, he works at Embyte, uh, which is an online uh, learning uh, company in India. And uh, the major role of this company is to build platforms uh, that would conduct tests as well as help uh, students learn how to excel in some of the competitive exams in India. So this company has a very uh, unique utility uh, called an academic knowledge graph which uh, is a little bit different than existing knowledge graph that we see out in the world. Uh, the additional thing that they have added is what they call as competencies, which tells uh, that suppose I give an exam and I am doing wrong in a one particular question, how I can trace back to the nearest possible answer that would actually help me or give me some trigger words 
that will make me uh, look into different topics that will help me uh, read those topics and get well, uh, get a high score in that particular section. So it's question by question, you're improving it. So it's a very interesting and it has a very unique utility in terms of improving your learning outcomes over the time. So I move to, uh, I just give the screen to Prashant, uh, who will walk you through the, uh, the chatbot called Knowledge Buddy, which I have been closely even checking that it's been uh, doing pretty interesting stuff. And it's whole solve, whole uh, lot of uh, knowledge graph and deep learning. It's, so it's, it's a perfect interface of knowledge graph and deep learning. Uh, Prashant, you can take the screen now. Yeah, sure. Hi guys, uh, thanks for inviting me and you know, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, so you know, so uh, uh, quick background on basically, you know, uh, uh, knowledge buddy. So basically, the, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. Okay, so you know, so, so basically <clears throat> purpose of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge buddy is to, you know, kind of be with student 24 seven. And you know, basically, you know, uh, souls, uh, you know, uh, to kind of you know, soul uh, st uh, student out, uh, you know, without like, basically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 waiting for teachers help and all that. Right? So basically, you know, uh, as of now, we we support uh, you know uh, two functionality. One is question answering, and uh, one is question generation. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, let me move to you know, basically the. Presentation. So, uh, Mara, so should I share my screen or uh, no? We can present on. Uh, you can share your screen. Okay, sure. Can you see my screen? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so, so uh, as I said that, basically we have uh, mainly uh, uh, two kind of functionalities. One is question answering and, and second is question generation. And we can call it like Q and QG. Right? So basically, you know, like, uh, this is kind of a you know, simple diagram which shows you know, uh, how both of them work. So like first one is like, uh, QA model. So the input of QA model will be basically QA means question answering. Right? So basically the uh, input of QA will be question and the context. Right? So basically, you know, uh, uh, context here can you know, mean, you know, like the from which uh, you know uh, uh, the question is, is being asked because basically the question will be one input and uh, the context or the paragraph you know, or the you know, kind of uh, uh, you know kind of relevant uh, relevant information will be you know, second input and both of them will, will be you know uh, uh, will be going to QA model and the you know uh, uh, it will kind of you know, uh, generate the answer and the uh, and the same for you know, uh, same for QG model you know just uh, you know kind of answer will be more above, more, more above and question you know will be more kind of, you know, uh, below. So the uh, input in QG model, you know, uh, uh, will be you know uh, answer in context, right? So basically, you know, uh, uh, from context is you know used for like from where you want to generate a question, and you know what should be the answer of that particular question. Okay, so basically, you know, uh, uh, if we give these two input and then uh, the QG model, which will uh, basically uh, QG model will will generate the question. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So like uh, you know. Uh, so I'll be showing that, you know, uh, demo uh, in a while. So basically, uh, yeah, so let me first of all, show the demo itself. Let me move to this point. Prashant, you can present your screen. Uh, you can present your presentation and then uh, you can play the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can uh, see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the video? Yes. Let me minimize it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me make it uh, yeah, auto. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, you know. Uh, so basically, uh, you know. Uh, now the body, you know, body starter. So, so now basically, you know, like uh, uh, this question uh, which I am asking, right? So you know, they are basically, you know, uh, literal anything. Okay. So let's take. Uh, what I asked was, you know, uh, what do we get when we combine acid and base? Okay, so basically, you know, like any question, you know, which come, come to students' mind, right? You know, uh, it's not like, you know, basically, it will work for all these questions, but basically, any, yeah, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, it's kind of like, you know, Siri or Alexa or, you know, uh, uh, or, 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 okay, good or something like that. Basically, we can, you know, uh, 
we can as a boat uh, by basically literally uh, uh, anything basically so this mode is called open book okay this is like uh, uh, out of you know all the from lower kg to you know uh, to standard tail you know from any standard from any subject you know from any you know uh, basically any topic uh, student can ask so, so the, the mode is called open book and the you know so, uh, the question is what do we get when we combine uh, uh, as a method so they so we call like you know salt and water so so i'm asking uh, one more uh, question which is let's say you know how many planets are there in the in the solar system right so so it will call like eight planets yeah so you called uh, answer is there and then this is uh, you know kind of third question let's say uh, so i'm asking who invented uh, telephone right so yeah so like no uh, uh, as you can guess from the question right like you know like these are you know not uh, uh, you know kind of uh, any topic related but like let's say whatever uh, student want to ask right so yeah so like so now basically i am selecting a book okay so like uh, we can see same from here right like the board is cvsc you know uh, a publisher is ncrt and the chapter is uh, acid base and uh, salt okay so so uh, you know uh, now what i can do is you know like basically i can you know uh, ask question from this uh, uh, book itself okay basically on the left side i you know uh, you can see the book's context and uh, you know, now uh, i am asking uh, you know, so basically you know uh, you can uh, you can imagine myself as a student okay then let's say i was reading this uh, you know uh, test book okay and then let's say you know from this text book let's say you no know, uh, i have one doubt right so like you know so uh, at that moment itself you know like uh, i can uh, ask it to both and then let's say you know basically uh, all this question right? like what is the color of litmus when it uh, when it is neither acidic nor basic basically all this question are uh, are particularly related to this uh, uh, this chapter Yeah, so you know, uh, then there's one one more functionality called in selected paragraph. Okay, so uh, you know, so like basically, whatever paragraph I select, sir, so you know, then you know, uh, uh, let's say, if I have you know any doubt from that particular that that particular paragraph, right? Then I then I can ask. So so you know, uh, let me pause for a bit. So let's say you know, like uh, so the paragraph is you already know the that acids are four in test and uh, change color of uh, blue litmus to red, whereas bases are bitter. and change the color of the red litmus to blue okay so basically uh, you know this is a kind of uh, whole picked up from that uh, textbook so the question and question i asked was uh, how does be, uh, basis test right so so we can say that you know bases are bitter all right so you know well, so uh, you know uh, like uh, what gives the you know uh, answer is bitter then uh, then the kind of we can ask basically you know, like uh, any question from this paragraph uh, and you know uh, what we try to answer what will basically you know, generate the answer yeah so uh, yeah so basically this was uh, you know uh, qg model which is you know uh, sorry uh, qa model basically you know we were asking the question and uh, what was uh, you know uh, uh, giving the answer and now what we can do is let's say you know uh, let, let's say student want to uh, check uh, his or her uh, ability okay so you know uh, what bot can also do is you know like uh, from this particular in chapter uh, bot can generate you kind know, of question and you know i will try to answer okay so let's say you know uh, let me rewind it, it a bit so so we can see here right? so basically so i change the chapter to you know uh, carbon and its compound and uh, you know so basically book uh, both itself you know generated this question called what uh, what group determines chemical properties in a homogeneous series and and then you know, then basically you know uh, according to my understanding of the chapter you know uh, i will try to answer and then you know, basically both uh, kind of generated the second uh, question for me and then you know, basically second time my my answer was wrong you know? so, so so it was like you know of the answer was this one Yeah, and and then you know, basically, uh, if I want to check myself, uh, you know, from the from select paragraph, right? So uh, that that I can do. I think. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, so basically, you know, uh, right now, what I'm doing is uh, I am selecting a paragraph from which uh, uh, I want to ask a question. Okay, so, so let's say, uh, I selected this paragraph and now bot will generate question from this paragraph. Okay, and, and you know, now uh, I as a student uh, have to answer. So I selected the paragraph mm, and, and now, uh, you know, uh, bot will generate the question. Something is loading. Let me reduce the resolution. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. Prashant, I have a question. So how, yeah, yeah, how, sure. are, the, how are the questions getting created? Yeah, uh, sure. So so basically, you know, like, uh, uh, as I said in the second slide, right, basically the input in uh, in uh, QG, which is in you know, question generation model, is the, the context which let's say uh, uh, students select this paragraph, right? So now, you know, basically answer will be, you know, basically generated by the system. Uh, which is you know basically we have a list of uh, certain academic words okay so let's say uh, you know uh, so so we can see certain you know, uh, academic words in the paragraph so let's say noble gas is there right and uh, uh, ionic compounds is you know uh, is a uh, uh, you know one academic uh, kind of a, a phrase right so so uh, you know so so uh, to the model uh, these two input will be given one is the selected paragraph and, and second is, uh, you know, let's say uh, answer is uh, ionic compound. Okay. So basically, these two input will be given and, uh, you know, uh, this model, which is in kind of a deep learning model, you know, uh, T5 model to be specific. And so, you know, so basically question will generate this, uh, uh, this question for which answer will be ionic compounds. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, basically so context will be given. For, yeah. So can I, as a student, contest the result? So you tell me that look, uh, the answer is not wrong, and I say no, it is correct. Yes. 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 Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we can do that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, you can see that basically the uh, uh, the bot uh, has the question, and let's say you no, know, uh, I I give my answer called noble gas configuration. And then you know, both told it nice, uh, that's correct. That basically, you know, uh, that was the correct answer of that uh, uh, question. Now let's say for the second question, which uh, what we'll ask. <coughs> so basically right, right now, what is generating the question uh, for, from this paragraph? And let's say, so my, my answer is uh, reactivity of uh, elements. Okay, but, but you know, but actually, <coughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so basically that was the, you know, uh, correct answer. Yeah, and, and by the way, you know, basically we can also change the language of this whole conversation to, you know, this all, you know, basically uh, uh, 11 Indian languages. Okay, basically Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, Tamil, you know, Bengali, uh, Punjabi, Oriya. Right? So basically we can do this conversation in any of these Indian languages. Right? So the, right now we were doing in, the, in English. Right? Uh, so basically so, so I selected Hindi. And you know, so, so uh, you know, uh, so, so uh, just should translate to to either to people who don't know Hindi. Basically, so what is asking is, आप मुझे क्या करना पसंद करोगे, right? So so basically, in English, you know, like what would you like me to do, right? So so I told like you know, uh, I want to ask you a uh, you know uh, ask you a question. So now whatever question you know, uh, both will generate, right? It will you know uh, basically show. In Hindi, okay. So, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, so you can see here, right? Uh, so, like, you know, this is basically a Hindi text, right? So, basically, uh, uh, previously, you know, uh, both used to ask the you know, a question in English, but you know, uh, now, as I have selected the, you know, my language is Hindi, then from now on, all the conversation which I will do, you know, with both, like, you know, uh, whether it will be, you know, basically, he will ask uh, me a question or, you know, uh, uh, I'll be typing it. So, basically, all of them, you know, uh, will be done in Hindi. Uh, Prashant, you have one more minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Yeah, so, so I give, you know, uh, uh, any compounds and yeah. Yeah, Manas, uh, I'm done okay. so, uh, with the demo. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, uh, just to add, uh, you know, uh, kind of a little bit. So basically what uh, uh, kind of future thing we can do is uh, we can add, you know, basically domain knowledge in this, uh, you know, uh, in this model. Yeah, by the way, you know, uh, all this QA model and QG model are nothing but, you know, self attention based uh, uh, T5 model, right? So basically, uh, you know, it, it's a generative model, you know, a sequence to sequence uh, self attention based model. Right? So basically this uh, Q and QG, both of them, you know, are uh, this uh, T5 based model and, you know, in future, we can add this KA, but uh, you know, uh, we can add basically, you know, the uh, domain knowledge from uh, knowledge graph, and uh, you know, uh, uh, so uh, me, uh, you know, my, you know, my colleague uh, Kaur and you no, know, uh, uh, Amit sir have, you know, basically proposed this model called uh, KA, but so basically the goal of this, you know, this model is to uh, to infuse the knowledge graph, uh, you know, on knowledge into this self attention based, uh, uh, you know. NLP models, right? So, so uh, uh, yeah. So basically, you know, uh, the idea is to you know basically to give model additional information so that the uh, performance will you know will improve. So basically, like you know, uh, if you want to show you know, more about this KI bot, uh, you can you know just search KI bot, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the Google or uh, if you have a, if you have access to these slides, you know, then uh, here is a paper link, right? Uh, it's available in the uh, archive. Yeah. Yeah, Manas. Thanks, Prashant. Uh, yeah. We now no questions if you have. Yeah. So, uh, Prashant, yeah. I have a question. This is the bluff. Uh, how, yeah, has yeah, sure. been, how has been the user's response to this experience? Having a chatbot ask questions and answer, right? So, how has been the user's yes. uh, uh, experience as of now? Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have not uh, basically you know, kind of productized uh, this uh, uh, chatbot. So, basically, we are planning to deploy this chatbot. You know, uh, so what I was showing was via our, uh, you know, what our, our uh, website. But you know, basically, this same chatbot can be, you know, uh, can be accessed via some WhatsApp, uh, you know, WhatsApp bot, Telegram bot, or you know, or, or basically. Uh, uh, in chatbot. So basically, we are planning to productize this chatbot in uh, uh, November or December, basically uh, incoming machine learning. Right now, it's not uh, being handled to uh, students. Yeah. Thanks, Prashant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so good morning to everyone present here and greetings to the people who are joining from other parts of the world. Uh, the title of the talk and the demo is Personalized Diet Management Chatbot. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Revati Venkatramanan, a PhD student here at University of South Carolina. Uh, my research interests are food computation models, process modeling and understanding, personalized digital healthcare, multimodal learning, and knowledge infused learning. Now into the talk. So why do we need uh, such a chatbot, which is going to help us manage the diet? We all know that food in itself is uh, medicine and it aids in the prevention and uh, treatment of various chronic diseases. Once a person contracts a chronic illness, a device diet management regimen becomes a part of their treatment plan. And the Dietary Guidelines of American co uh, states that focusing on excess calorie consumption and making informed decision about food choices and physical activity can uh, help attain a healthier weight and reduce the risk of chronic illness. But what is the challenge here? Why is the diet management a challenging task? So the first thing is when we see a food, we don't know the calorie count of that particular food. And the second step is what is the nutrition breakdown of that particular food? Uh, a salad can be so much, a salad of uh, 500 calories and a burger of 500 calories has different constituent. We need to know how much of carb, how much of fat is present in both of the food items. And the next question is, is it good for my health? For example, 
a food recommendation looks completely different for someone with diabetes and for someone who has hypertension with diabetes or cholesterol or any other chronic illness that we know. And the third question, the fourth question is, is this the food of my liking? So there are already so many filters that we have. And on top of that, choosing the food that we generally like to eat is again a challenging task. And there are also users who has various food allergies and uh, such as someone who's lactose intolerant or uh, who, who are allergic to peanuts and, and so on. So we propose a system that can estimate the calorie intake and nutrition breakdown of the food, that can keep track of the calorie intake, recommend meals use, uh, based on users' health condition and food preferences, and where you can compare your dietary intake and the diet that is being monitored against various parameters, such as someone who has to manage their weight against their food uh, can compare the weight against the calorie intake. And someone who is, uh, who is diabetic can monitor their sugar against the food or food that they are eating and the calorie trend. So here is a small demo of the nutrition management chatbot that we built. Uh, it can uh, log the food based on users uh, text or voice. Uh, you're also looking into nutrition and diet management. Essential nutrition intake and controlled calorie consumption significantly improve quality of life and overall well-being or overall health. But the challenge for the person here is knowing the nutrition information and of the cumulative calorie consumption of their meals. Nourish is a chatbot built upon Google Assistant. It helps the users to manage and monitor their dietary patterns and debate and assist them in making more informed decisions about their food choices. It provides nutrition information for food or meals reported by the user, keeps track of cumulative calorie intake and recommended it. It alerts the user with personalized information, for example, for excess calorie consumption. Okay, tell me the nutritional content of one cheesecake. Here's what I found. It may not be a good idea for you to have cheesecake based on your diet restriction uh that was a very short demo and okay uh this is a chatbot we built which uh helps user to log the meal based on text and voice um, i also have another demo uh just to show that it can also be done based on the uh, based on images of the food itself uh the chatbot that we we were using before to not have the camera in it, but it can be incorporated. So this is just showing that it, it can be done using this too.
since we are running short of time, I'll just cut the demo short and go over to the presentation. Uh, we also deployed a variation of these applications to real world patients. Uh, one of our notable uh, deployment was done with the bariatric surgery patients. So immediately after the surgery, they are supposed to have a, a strict protocol of their diet, which they are supposed to follow. So we developed an application, uh, KHEL Bariatrics, which helps user to track their meals. And when we deployed it to uh, five bariatric surgery patients, we received a, positive, a, a very good positive feedback. They were 90%, they gave a rating of 90 out of 100 for the application uh, in terms of its usability, the way it aids them to keep track of their meals and uh, makes, which helps them make informed decisions about their food choices. Currently, uh, application for uh, type 1 diabetes is under development. Uh, for type 1 diabetes patients, they have to know the amount of carbohydrate in their food so that they can take the insulin accordingly. Uh, and we also have uh, one other application uh, under development for hypertension patients as well. Thank you. That's it. Any questions? Like a controlled, it's randomized controlled trial. Exactly. Okay. I didn't want to use RCT because we'll use large sample sizes. <laughs> yeah, very similar. Yeah. Thank okay. you. That's absolutely, and that's kind of the subject on the panel, really. That's absolutely how we want to do everything. Uh, everything needs to have the the rigor and, yeah. 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 The whole thing is, though, we are at the stage where we need to demonstrate to, uh, uh, you know, basically you are our first audience where you feel comfortable that it can be then evaluated. We can't go directly to the patients. And as you might see, majority of our, at least my groups, uh, applications are healthcare settings. And, and I, I can't go directly to the patients. So <laughs> the whole idea is to work with in, uh, uh, in diabetes, in hypertension, in mental health, in all of them we have, uh, and in, uh, you know, we have partners. In food also, there are, there are partners. So, uh, but we are at a stage where uh, the technology is maturing and uh, typically we're looking for applying for, you know, grants to allow us to have, to have the funding so you can do 50 to 200 kind of patient trials. Okay. Now the questions are stop sharing. Thank you. Now we have portfolio. So when there is a motivated, uh, you know, uh, clinical, uh, potential clinical partner, you can say, here are all the things you can do, let's do the things we can. And so, you know, two or three of these are explicitly, um, you know, they are SPAR funded or they are um, explicitly done to collect human data so we can go further. Uh, Brian, you had a question? You had oh. your hand. Thank you, Biplov. I, I do. And, and Ravathi, thank you for that outstanding presentation. And Dr. Narissiman, thank you for insisting that we heard it because I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I got to hear that. Um, I had just a question putting on in part my, my lawyer hat for a moment. Um, and that is, you know, two foods that look identical can have dramatically different nutrition profiles, right? So eggs could have trans fat or not, could have high sugar or not. Um, is there a way that, that your app deals with that challenge? And I thought particularly of the peanut example you had in the demo. Um, that's a, a, a health and safety critical issue for somebody that has a nut allergy. Um, and are there, is there a concern that they might rely too much on this? You know, a, a mistake at one tenth of one percent of accuracy could be somebody's death. So how do you approach those questions, both in terms of design and ultimately in terms of communicating to your users? Uh, so to answer your first question, um, 
we do have so many foods that do look alike, such as bagels and donuts and scrambled eggs with mac and cheese. Uh, this is one of the problems I'm trying to solve by incorporating external knowledge into the model itself so that it can, it can identify and distinguish at its best when two foods do look similar. And when it comes to food, the, there is so much dynamics that we can't really associate one label with the food. Uh, so when you take a bagel and stuff it with a patty and uh, some vegetables in it, it almost becomes a burger. So in those cases, we first try to identify the ingredients that are present in the food and then make the nutrition estimation accordingly. And uh, to answer the second question, uh, such as uh, allergic, such as peanuts and those situations, we also do give uh, override to the users whenever they, so let's say that the system has identified that particular food wrong. In most cases, the users do know that, okay, this the name of this food is not right. It has identified, uh, uh, mac and cheese as scrambled eggs. So users can override there. And in that scenario, in those scenarios, we do have access to one of the largest nutrition databases in the world, which is Edamum. So they have a well curated database and they have the nutrition information of scrambled eggs itself. We can get, we can get more informed uh, nutrition estimation of that particular food from there. And in case of allergies, we are still trying our best, uh, but if again the user feels uncomfortable or if when the user is in doubt, they can always uh, override, uh, provide their override from their side. Uh, I'll just add a few things. Um, so uh, this is a huge market, first of all, the food related things, both. Um, uh, so the company, Edema, and uh, for disclosure, I would say I'm an advisor to the company. Uh, they have 7 million recipes. Uh, they have 700 different types of cuisine. So like low fat diet or keto diet is one of the 700 types of cuisine. And uh, the uh, data gets, uh, this food knowledge base gets now used extensively in uh, the real world. So uh, company has customers like Nestle and Amazon and uh, all, all kinds of major, major uh, companies that are using uh, food information in a variety of products. From our perspective, um, you would like to distinguish that in, you know, the role that this technology can, can pay in, uh, play in terms of assistant versus an expert guidance. And for now, we will explicitly in the consenting process, in the training that we give it to the user, we say we are not the expert. Um, we'll be more, you know, so when you're doing food logging, uh, you are trying to achieve something far better than what the users would do on their own. Being able to, and in fact, we just had a conversation with uh, an expert in the field. Uh, they would, they said, well, it's unlikely that people will take photographs uh, while they're in restaurants with other people. And so we are talking about, you know, they, but they would, they would speak out to or text to the, uh, you know, um, this uh, agent uh, more frequently. So there are wide variety of issues behind this whole thing. That, that we are looking at it, uh, yes, it, you, you do have, and, but on the other hand, just the same way that the restaurant has to, is a liable, you know, does it have liability in, for allergy versus, so the same thing, we we'll, we'll try to frame it uh, in the same way uh, uh, as to the technology that we offer. But anyway, that's a longer issue and why we should have a conversation <laughs> along this line. And, and I think your, your mention of liability was very important. Uh, a restaurant could, in fact, be liable if it misrepresents its ingredients. Um, and if this, you know, were to fail to detect dust, nut powder that was used, say, in a donut, uh, I think that would be a real challenge from an engineering and a legal perspective. I think kind of of airbags, right? Ideally, you don't need to use the airbag. Ultimately, they're supposed to improve safety and do, but in the case where they fail, um, the company behind them can, can be liable. Uh, and so you're, you're doing a great social good. Um, there is also a, a legal risk inherent in that. Uh, kudos to you. All right, uh, thanks, Brian. Actually, we have in this room some display problem, <laughs> but anyway, it will go away. Uh, so I think uh, we can move to the panel right now. And what I would suggest is that uh, we come to the front of the uh, 
the room. And uh, Laura, if you may just uh, come here. And uh, uh, in the room, we also have Mila. So just come over. I'll put the camera over here so that we can see you. And Brian, we are going to miss you, but <laughs> so uh, Brian, just uh, I apologize. There are some questions I have uh, told other members in the room, but you don't have access to it. <laughs> okay, that was not by design. Okay, <laughs> yeah, please. So that will make my <laughs> answers even more peculiar. <laughs> All right. This uh, is what you pay for, Brian. We're not being. <laughs> I'm I'm embracing physical distancing to the max. <laughs> All right. Um. So, uh, just give me one second. Give me um. Um, Zoom. People see it. Let me just. Okay. Okay. We'll just get started. And uh, so, good morning again. Uh, just a few minutes before noon. So we are very excited to have uh, a distinguished set of panelists in front of us. And uh, what we I thought we would discuss is that uh, a whole bunch of uh, chatbots and uh, decision support tools you heard about this morning. Okay. You heard about the contest. Uh, you may have noted that we had one live demo and four of them were videos. Okay. And even the best of the demos, right? When uh, uh, Google or Amazon or Apple, they go and go to the demos, right? They do the live demos in Comdex or Apple World or what else, so on. What is the mark of a good demo session? Anyone wants to mention? You remember a good demo session? Yeah. <laughs> if there is a failure. Okay. A good demo session is where you have a failure. <laughs> okay. After which I talked about Google Duplex or what was that? Right. There was a controversy. Okay. There should be a failure. There should be a controversy. Right. Otherwise, everything is orchestrated. Okay. Why does that happen? Okay, the reason we are doing a demo is because we are risking something. Okay. And in live world, right, there's always failure. Okay. So decision support tools also, there will be a lot of failures. So the topic of the panel today is how to build trust in collaborative assistance. Okay. Whether it is in hardware, software, robots, all the things, right? How do we build trust in that? Okay and especially solve the region where we are, okay? We can solve the world's problems, but if we can't solve the problems at home, then I think there is something missing. So how do we do that in user-centered validation and testing? So testing and validation is very important, right? So I'm just bringing three things together. One is building trust in the decision support tools while solving regional problems. And how do you do that? Uh, testing and validation is one of the ways engineering people do it. Okay. So how do we do that? So that's the topic today. And we have a very distinguished set of panelists from different uh, background. Uh, very happy to have Laura Bukanufuso. Uh, I'm sorry, um, messing the name. Uh, but uh, she is uh, uh, a role model of a student from University of South Carolina, having graduated from here, having formed a company, and uh, been doing very well in the local region. Okay. So uh, then we have um, uh, Mira Narsimhan. Uh, uh, she is a multifaceted person. So there's a very long bio and very, very distinguished uh, uh, a doctor, a consultant to the government here, and has a lot of local impact. Okay. Then we have uh, Brent Walker Smith. Uh, a very energetic uh, lawyer, professor, and who's been working with the technology uh, uh, 
and, and you saw him ask questions about in the previous uh, talk. Uh, then we have uh, Amit, uh, the director of the lab, and uh, looking into various uh, work we have been doing, right? So I thought that we could uh, um, have uh, a discussion along these things. So what I would request is each of the panelists to take a couple of minutes, just introduce themselves. And uh, then from there, I have some set of questions I will start, but uh, maybe just a few words about themselves they want to talk about two to three minutes, please. Starting with Laura. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so as, as uh, just mentioned, I was a PhD student here in computer science a number of years ago from 2014 to 2017. Um, actually, just before 2017, I uh, accepted a position at Yale as a postdoc and then became a research scientist there for another year and a half. Um, it was during that time at Yale when I was working with the Child Study Center and the Social Robotics Lab that I started developing um, a new robot that combined sort of the aggregated 12 years of academic research I had done in the social robotics field, combined sort of the, the knowledge that we had collected in field studies over those years to build a, a robot that would um, really address some of the biggest learning challenges that we saw in, in society and across a large number of um, students. So started building that in the workshop at home and then left the academic world in 2017 um, to begin the company full time. Um, Avi is now, uh, was named the Times Best Invention of the Year last year in 2020 in education. We're in six countries across the world um, and we're actually just uh, launched a new research study with the Department of Education with about 3,000 students. Um, in a number of underserved communities. So we're really excited to have so much adoption of the technology, but also to learn so much along the way. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Mira Narasimhan, currently the chair of psychiatry here in the Department of Neuropsychiatry. So yeah, Chris Mahal is a health service consultant for the Princeton of the University of South Carolina for health innovations. And so I've been in the state of South Carolina for the past 23 years. And of course, Laura and I have a connection. I have two connections with Laura. One is the fact that uh, I trained at Yale before I moved to the University of South Carolina. She did it the other way around. And uh, some of the work that we've done, so it started a clinical translational kind of division within the Department of Psychiatry here when I moved from Yale. And I have uh, one of my research directors who is here with me. Uh, Department who's been working with some of uh, the students within the uh, uh, division. And uh, what we've clearly, we've kind of, you know, looked at from clinical translation research, which was an area that we were very passionate about, to technology kind of driven research over the course of the last decade or so. We kind of uh, started with telehealth. So we clearly have a large presence within uh, the state of South Carolina. We have done a lot of work across the nation, kind of being a part of the American Psychiatric Association, and subsequently some global work in India too, kind of taking technology to that part of the world where there's a significant uh, need, given the shortage of providers that we have uh, within for a, you know, a little over a billion lives that we have in, in the Indian subcontinent. We've also done some work with virtual reality, and uh, clearly with uh, Dr. Shed being a part of uh, the U USC family, uh, more recently over the past couple of years, kind of just the ability to kind of work more closely with the AI Institute has truly been an eye opener for many, many of us from the healthcare realm to be able to learn so much from kind of just the you know bright intellectuals that you all are. Just basically seeing some of the demo that we did today, uh, I think there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of scope to be able to kind of collaboratively work together. And I think there's a very significant need for interest some of the challenges and which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation what the state of South Carolina faces and it truly requires and behooves all of us to come together to be able to be more collaborative and think about the system of these issues moving forward so that we can help serve the system to us. Uh, Brian do you want to introduce yourself uh, say a few words oh uh sure I would be <laughs> Too. So hi everybody. I'm I'm Bryant Bryant Walker Smith. Um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about what I call the law of the newly possible. How law affects technology and technology affects law. Um, and this is my second year at this conference. 
So last year I ended with this question, are companies worthy of the trust that we place in them? And there are two keys in formulating this. Uh, the first is that I focus on trustworthiness rather than trust. And the second is that I focus on companies rather than on technologies. And I think each of these is a very important distinction. Um, why? So first, companies act through their human and machine agents, right? through their employees and through their algorithms. Uh, second, products are only as safe as the companies behind them. Um, third, we have to think of safety as a marriage that is a lifelong commitment involving a company rather than a wedding, you know, a one-time event where we all get dressed up and celebrate. Uh, and finally, and importantly, technologies are going to fail. Right? These chatbots are not going to be perfect. Even if the technologies have failed, the companies behind them can still do right. Um, and I will note, and before I realize I'm totally, totally hijacking this for three minutes, um, is that by safety, I mean physical, emotional, and financial well-being. And so collaborative assistance can implicate every one of those. That's a, that's a broad conception of safety. And so the key question this year is, I think, how should a company earn trust? And my answer to that is that a trustworthy company shares its safety philosophy, makes a promise to the public, and then keeps that promise. So what do each of these mean? First, in terms of a safety philosophy, a company is saying, this is what we're doing. This is why we think it's reasonably safe. And this is why you, public, can believe us. The company makes a public promise then by saying, first, we market only what we believe to be reasonably safe. Second, we will be candid about our limits and failures. We'll be open about them. That's part of our story. That's part of our safety case. And when we fail, we will make it right. And then the company keeps that promise by first appropriately managing public expectations, not overhyping, not overpromising. Second, by supervising their entire product life cycle, right? not putting a product out and washing their hands of it, but by continuing to monitor and update it. And third, by mitigating harms promptly, fully, and this is important to me, publicly. That's my introduction. Also, this is me. Thanks, Pippo. <laughs> Thank you. And Brian, it's very interesting. You are popping up all these uh, uh, speaking points, right? Uh, that's really good use of technology. <laughs> Why, thank you. As I said in chat, just think of me as your friendly chatbot. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Amit. Yeah. Um, just have a remark about, you know, to what Brian said, though. Um, I am totally convinced companies are simply not trustworthy. Uh, we have seen that with ample evidence of uh, Facebook and all these technology companies, what they have done. Uh, so we'll come back to that if, if, we, if we get on discussing that issue. But let me start here out with noticing a couple of things. Uh, first of all, what a wonderful thing that here we are meeting two years um, after the start of the AI student, so many of you have shown up here that in this such a short period of time, we have such a body of work that is going on and that um, we are able to do that in the presence of uh, Daisy, Susan, Brian, uh, Mira, and Laura. Uh, and, and, you know, really, um, that, that really shows the extension uh, that uh, the AI Institute has uh, across our community of, you know, on the campus. Um, that, in a nutshell, uh, you know, distinguishes uh, the AI Institute, our philosophy, our way of doing it. Um, now that also gets reflected in the body of work that we uh, are doing and would be doing in this broad area that the KC, uh, you know, event is about in that it is highly interdisciplinary, it is highly translational. The technology is a core component, but technology by itself will simply not uh, make anything successful. So um, the technology, and this is one interesting uh, type of one particular technology where 
the thing cannot simply end with technology. Uh, end with technology. The way the technology touches uh, the humans, the patients, the society is ex ex extremely critical uh, to to the work we do. Uh, uh, in many other uh, areas of computer science and AI, we can do research with some public data, publish it, and and get done with it. Uh, here. Um, really uh, engaging the users of the technology or the uh, people who are impacted by the use of the technology becomes very crucial and hence the topic uh, that Diplo has chosen here with the importance of you know safety as, as one of the issues as well as um, uh, um, uh, you know uh, how you address the various challenges uh, that that's very pertinent. One last point before I be more is that um, In, is, is, is a strategic vision. Uh, I have chosen to fo uh, focus a little bit more on where uh, the chatbots or assistants or these collaborative agents can make real world impact. And then I found the, 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 the area of uh, chronic health disease to be a, a particularly, uh, you might say, sweet spot or sweet spot where. Um, uh, people who really need to manage health day to day and that if the right technologies develop would have substantial you know pull and push to get actually adapted for with great outcome thank you so thank you all the panelists uh, for uh, introducing uh, themselves their work and their perspective I want to start off with uh, one question, which is, from your perspective, what are the South Carolina specific challenges that you feel? So whether you are working in education or in health or from legal area, right? What is the South uh, Carolina or I would say regional Southeast uh, US uh, problems do you see? Laura, you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I think it's a it's a it's a question that I want to answer from the perspective of adoption of technology, um, because when we started the company, when I founded the company, we really had the choice to found it anywhere, right? So I mean, we we had sort of the we could have moved to the east coast, the west coast, and tried to establish the company and grow it there. I think regionally we have specific challenges here that may not exist elsewhere but there are other sets of challenges that exist elsewhere that we do not see here. So I think regionally our greatest challenges are, can be summed up by saying that there is a reluctance to change. Um, there happens to be a very well-trodden road in a lot of areas in South Carolina that um, people are reluctant to veer away from. That hurts us as a community. Uh, it hurts us as researchers. It hurts us as uh, a growing marketplace. So I think that those are probably, those challenges are, are ones that we have come up to and, and found ways around to some extent, of course, not 100% uh, in, every, in every way, but, but I think those are probably the, the persisting challenges that we see okay. from the company standpoint. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Mira, you want to? So I think from a healthcare perspective, if you look at the state of South Carolina, which I just looked at the Kaiser Foundation uh, kind of you know uh, stats, so South Carolina is the bottom ten, right? The forty first in the nation, and nothing to be proud of. So uh, so clearly, given that access to care is a significant issue, right? I mean, we don't we are not producing enough providers, whether it is uh, within medicine, whether it's within nursing, social work, pharmacy, you name it. it is, our sick health plan is colleges. So that's a significant deterrent in terms of being able to reach out, to be able to provide that level of care for our citizens. Cost, right? How do we bring down cost of care? That's such a significant issue. Uh, disease burden, Dr. Shed kind of mentioned about uh, chronic disease, right? So if you look at the top 10 disease states in the state of South Carolina, you're looking at heart disease, you're looking at diabetes, you're looking at depression. I mean, we just kind of, you know, I've been looking at some of the depression data. We do a lot of surveillance for suicidality and depression across uh, the state. 
and the rates of depression and anxiety have gone up two to three folds compared to pre-COVID, right? So that's a significant, enormous burden. I mean, if you look, ask the state agency like the Department of Health and Human Services, what are the major kind of suckers of kind of your, your budget? It's heart disease, it's depression, it's diabetes. Those are the three. So clearly kind of, you know, we are in a state wherein we have all of those stroke, cardiovascular disease as a risk factor for stroke. We are the buckle of the, bed, the stroke belt. So both North and South Carolina, we clearly have a very significant prevalence of stroke within our uh, states. And then of course the rural urban divide, right? That's so significant. State of South Carolina is fairly rural, so to speak. And uh, even when we had, uh, you know, when we saw that exponential growth in telehealth during COVID, even though we were a very well kind of, you know, set state in terms of the infrastructure that we had for tele, uh, we did find a digital divide. So digital divide can be threefold. One is not having broadband access, which again has implications for chatbots Absolutely. and anything else that we go on to create. Number two was the ability of these individuals to afford a gadget. We are all blessed to have iPhones and iPads and everything else. I mean, you have people within the socioeconomic strata in the state of South Carolina who don't even have a phone, let alone an iPhone or uh, you know other gadgets. And then of course, third would be how do you navigate these tools? because that's a significant issue. So we had elderly, we would give them appointments for telehealth, and you can connect from your home, but then they didn't know how to navigate the, you know, how do I get to kind of, you know, if I said a link, how do I kind of do that? So that was a significant challenge for each of us. Now, you know, Laura has kind of talked about it from an education perspective, literacy rates in the state of South Carolina, that's a challenge in itself, because we've got to surmount and overcome that challenge. Um, you know, the racial divide that exists, we have 30% of uh, our uh, population is African-American. You go to a, a, state, a county like Orangeburg, it's about 60%. So just again, the rural urban divide, shortage of providers. In the state of South Carolina, just looking at psychiatry itself, we only have 600 psychiatrists for 5 million lives. How do you go about addressing kind of the enormity of the uh, problem that I just talked about? Well, I think, to me, artificial intelligence and clearly chatbot as one of those components is going to be a game changer. Uh, how do we make it more relatable in terms of getting it across to our healthcare colleagues and saying it's not something that's going to replace humans, but it's going to be a complement or an augment to some of the, 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 the level of care that we're providing to our uh, citizens in the state. Uh, thanks, Mira. So what we heard was uh, Laura talking about the general um, problems in education and um, awareness, and Mira talking about um, uh, health and the access issue. So I wanted to uh, check if uh, Bryant uh, and uh, Ahmed, you want to add anything uh, from uh, legal support point of view and any other perspective you think that there are problems uh, that you would like to call out environment or anything else. Oh my goodness, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> uh, one minute. So, <laughs> um, so I, I think first of all, you know, a broader point, technologies can ameliorate existing problems and they can exacerbate existing problems. They can create new problems and they can offer new opportunities. So it's a complex mix. And I think there are two ways of looking at this question. One is the specific challenges that the technologies are going to face. Um, the other is the specific challenges the technologies can help address. So on the, the former point, first of all, the perception of our state, I think, remains a significant problem. And that perception is in some ways very deserving. Um, many of our statistics are abysmal. Uh, and if we don't address that, I don't think we deserve some of the innovation that other places are giving. Um, many big companies are going to manufacture here. They're not going to design and manage here. And that's a real problem for innovation. Um, secondly, Centralization and consolidation uh, continue to be global trends. Uh, and we as a state, I think, are not well positioned in a future where there is increased consolidation or centralization of technologies and businesses. So ways that technologies could help South Carolina specifically. First of all, in law, we have a huge access to justice problem. Right? We have glaring legal needs that are not being met. Um, lawyers are too few. I know it's it's it's. Funny to hear me say that, um, 
or I should say more specifically, affordable lawyers, affordable legal services are too few. People are not getting the early legal help that they need. And that's a real potential area for collaborative assistance. The second is early warning systems, the early interventions that we could offer people on a variety of levels so that their problems don't ultimately become legal problems. All right, so early warning systems for domestic violence, for motor vehicle death, for gun crime, for educational distress. How early can we give people low transaction cost, easily accessible uh, ways to get intervention so that their problems do not grow even, even larger? Those are what I see as the, the real opportunities for us as a, as a community. Uh, thank you, Brent. Amit. What I'd like to uh, say very briefly is that um, we have uh, thankfully aligned um, our research very highly with the challenges South Kerala faces. It starts with uh, health. We have five to ten projects going on right now that are in health in, in collaboration with South Kerala uh, uh, you know, uh, clinicians and, and providers. Second is education. We have a growing portfolio of um, you know, uh, projects starting to do work on education, um, forest, uh, we flow, I are directly involved in education related projects. Uh, they also involve, we also saw one chatbot, but there are other things that are coming about. Just this Monday, there'll be uh, two proposals going out on education. Uh, we had a major proposal on education uh, earlier sent out. And I'm, you know, we are engaged with um, all for SC and with uh, regional school district, uh, and that is 55 percent uh, uh, people, a person of poverty, and also majority African American uh, school district, and big challenge there. But we are engaged with that, and we are looking at uh, different again, in broadly in AI and also in chatbot uh, engaging uh, education. The third is manufacturing. We this year won three grants already on smart manufacturing, uh, worked jointly with uh, you know McNair Aerospace. But this involves partners such as um, you know actually four grants we won in related manufacturing BMW, uh, uh, Siemens, uh, and and whole variety of different companies I involved. So um, these are uh, absolutely the key challenges that state has identified. In his report, and uh, for one reason or another, uh, we found uh, that our collaborations, our applications, our translation research is directed towards these um, uh, general areas. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. So, uh, the next question which I would uh, like to you to consider is uh, and it, this can be in any order what is the best experience you can reflect on? when you felt that technology like chatbots or decision support, right, could be really helpful. So is there a specific instance you can think where you felt, yes, this is where the technology can help, right? And uh, I, I want you to kind of share if that was a, a aha moment for you, because my following question will be about the risk. So when, when did you really feel that, yes, this is one unique situation in my, um, health or in education or in our children with the social robots, right? When you felt, yes, this is the user, um, they will benefit from technology. I mean, given the magnitude of the problem that we just talked about, so like, yeah. let me take the question of price, for example. Yeah. So, so to me, uh, like, is there an efficient way in which we can triage individuals? So can we leverage these collaborative assistants to help us in terms of funneling the right patients who need to get to a provider's door versus others, right? So like, people go through crisis, right? Crisis is a part of life. So kind of how do we then start to triage those individuals? So that's kind of clearly an area that you know, it would be a value add. Another would be monitoring. So in between, kind of as an assistant, right? So in between uh, for provider therapy visits, is that something that can fill the gap that does exist? And of course, that also uh, bodes well for uh, kind of the uh, social and medical management as such. So helping improve outcome as a consequence. And then of course, at some point, are there screen can it be used as a screening? Clearly some of the work that Manas and Kaushik are doing under uh, Amit's leadership and trying to see, can we also kind of use this 
more as a, uh, as a diagnostic tool that would help assist us humans, kind of the medical service providers, to better serve our clients. And of course, uh, you know, you talked earlier about, I think, uh, 60 years ago, Eliza kind of, you know, was that support. It, mm -hmm. it was like a psychotherapist, right, being there. Uh, so, so, so to me, it's like, you know, can this be used as that level of support, that advisement, when you don't, when you can't reach your provider or your provider is busy taking care of other more kind of, you know, sicker patients. And also kind of, can this also be used as a way to kind of guide people for resources? Not everybody needs to come to me. There are other resources too that they may be able to make available. of. And that 24 seven ability to do so versus you know waking up somebody in the middle of the night. So I think there's a lot of scope and you've seen a lot of that with it during COVID-19, sharing of information that kind of clearly happened across the board, kind of providing uh, individuals uh, information on how to monitor your symptoms if you ended up having for COVID-19, right? So what do you do next? So those were kind of clearly things that we saw, low-hanging fruit, and I think that has a great deal of applicability to where I come from, kind of from my own uh, mental health skills. Okay. Brant, Laura, Amit, you want to say, was there any specific instance or anything you can reflect on, right? Yes, this is the user who would have really benefited, but the technology was not there, so I should so build that technology. For yeah. me, it is easier to answer this question because I've done founded or co-founded four companies um, and uh, in, in, you know, in variety of ways they have an impact. In some cases, investors become rich. Uh, in other cases, uh, they are real users uh, that um, you know, benefited. I'll give the, just one example uh, given the time. Um, so a lot of what we did was um, in a social media analysis and it has been applied both for social good application and social harm applications. Um, and, uh, you know, the, so this work we started on the day um, uh, uh, the terrorists struck uh, Mumbai. Uh, and I did over the date, the uh, 26th of um, November 2008. And I asked my student, Karthik, Karthik, start gathering the tweets. We were going to start analyzing this and create spatial network thematic mapping of that. Eventually, we did people content network, uh, sentiment, emotion, intent analysis. Um, but then that led to an, uh, addressing a variety of real world challenges. We predicted 2012 election, 2016 election, Brexit, uh, both with Modi's 2016 uh, election, but we also monitored um, you know, various disasters. So I remember a colleague, uh, a, somebody I know very well, um, uh, she was head of analytics, um, uh, in, in, in the main research uh, organization in Singapore. She contacts me saying, uh, Amit, I can't uh, contact my parents. Uh, would you, would you, you, you work on social media, can you, can you find out what's happening? Within two and a half hours, I was able to uh, you know, reach out to her that um, uh, her parents are in this particular area of Chennai. Uh, there, what I see is that uh, most likely there is no uh, significant flooding there. The uh, you know likely that the power is down and the cell phone service is down, and so she got that you know personal thing, and then we went on to really have the Chennai wide uh, you know analysis um, of, of uh, uh, you know who is coordinating what on medicine and so on and so forth, but then that went on to um, you know variety of other uh, we looked at the problem of um, uh, the. Uh, harassment on social media and look at the problem of gender violence in five countries with the United Nations Population Fund. And then I founded the, uh, the fourth company, Cognovi Labs, which is doing you know, very, very well. Um, and, and eight of my students were co-inventors on the IP uh, and also had a financial um, you know, um, event because of that. So I think that technology uh, uh, or certainly uh, can you know, touch upon so many things, uh, local job creation, uh, economic development, uh, addressing uh, major uh, problems, uh, societal and uh, individual problems. Okay, I'd like to move to, so Brent, unless you have something to add, I want to move to a related question. Let me, let me just answer that really yeah, quick. Yeah, I, I think I appreciate the perspective that you both um, shared. I think one thing that's really important 
um, you know, when you translate technology from the university to the commercial space, and some of you may be thinking of doing this and are already doing it with other companies, maybe thinking of venturing out on your own, there, there is definitely several validating moments, I think, along the way that tell you that you're on the right path. Yes. And that comes from your stakeholders. That comes from the product market fit. And I think that, you know, as an academic, when I was researching, I, was, I wanted to build technology that would support kids that I was working with. I was working with an expert in child development. She was a speech and language pathologist. And she kept saying, well, can you make the technology do this? And can you make it do this? And I have students that have this uh, challenge and this developmental struggle. And so we would, we would iteratively, iteratively change that technology to fit the things that she wanted. But at one point, other stakeholders like her started coming to me and saying, I want that. I, I want that. Can I get one for myself? Can I get one for my clinic? Can I get one for here? And when you start hearing that validation in multiple increments, you're on to something. That's, that's when you know that you have that fit, when you, when you realize this is a technology that can really help the people I'm building this for. Okay, Brian? That's all really, really well said. Um, I think collaborative assistance really illustrate what we otherwise often forget in the field of technology, which is technologies exist to serve people. Um, and so I agree wholeheartedly with, with what, um, what was said, um, particularly in decision support. And I would add to that the opportunity to avoid confirmation bias, where we have the potential of collaborative assistance that actually fight with us and push us in directions that we otherwise wouldn't be inclined to go. And so really it's this integrated combination of humans and algorithms where one supports the other that is especially important. Um, a specific application, anything to reduce driver distraction, although this is also a very risky proposition when you get into, into these kind of ergonomics, human factors questions. Okay, so I have a related question, which is what are the risk your users uh, experience in the technology you are developing or, or your stakeholders raise. So I'll just uh, talk about health, okay? Uh, You're using a, a chatbot for dry aging, okay? And I as a person feel that, uh, hey, I'm being told the virtual assistant, not the real doctor. And there is somehow a gap in the quality of the care I will get. So I'm probably a poor person and that's why, you know, so you're, uh, so just as a taking as a negative thing, right? I can feel myself being discriminated because you're not using technology as something cheap, right? Or something uh, template based rather than the actual user. So what are the kind of, uh, this is just a risk. Someone might feel that way. So what are the risks uh, your users uh, may have and what are you doing about it? So I think I would kind of uh, categorize it both from a user perspective, but also from a provider who also is the other user, right? who's also using chat yeah. to be able to assist them. So, so to me, from uh, if you look at healthcare as such, I think we always have, whether we pick a medication or we, or we pick a therapy, we always try to weigh the risks and benefits. Right? So that's that's always been the Hippocratic oath, making sure you're, you're doing right, you're you know benefiting the patient. So when you're doing a risk benefit analysis for anything you know AI related, including the collaborative assistant, I think you're looking at it from an ethical perspective. Are there ethical issues that will come up, right? Which which they do. Uh, how does it threaten privacy, confidentiality? Because I'm sharing it with this kind of you know it's up there somewhere, right? Anybody can have access to it. Nothing is safe, right? Cybersecurity is another big issue, kind of, you know, that's the, the, the school of engineering is tackling. Um, so privacy confidentiality, patient consenting, right? Very often that that is a significant issue. So and then of course autonomy of the patient. Are we in a sense kind of depriving them, taking away that autonomy from the patient? That's one. The other bucket would be kind of now, you know, we've seen the generation kind of uh, X, Y, and Z embracing technology. So are we as uh, kind of, you know, faculty members, are we doing our due diligence in being able to train the next generation on trying to kind of understand this, this kind of, you know, the ethical dilemma as well as the complexities of introducing uh, AI and uh, CAs into this mix, but also making sure to see how they assist. So kind of, uh, I think that's the second bucket. And the third bucket would be probably legal. From a legal perspective, uh, medical malpractice, 
what is the liability? So let's say we just saw Kaushik present kind of, I am suicidal. I want to kill myself. What happens there? If you, if you miss the boat there in terms of how does that information get relayed to the provider or to their practice or to the ED or wherever it needs to be kind of funneled to. So I think that's a significant issue. And then of course, the use of kind of this black box algorithm, right? How would you come to this reduction at the end of the day? How do we wet that constantly with the providers to be able to say, okay, I would have made a similar decision versus you know, the computer or kind of you know, this uh, algorithm making that decision for us. So I think those would be kind of concerns from a healthcare perspective for us as users. See, um, we can see the recent history that uh, technology has uh, played a significant role, role in increasing the disparity. And um, corporations have found a way to use the technology in such a way that um, they have enriched themselves in their stakeholders. stakeholders. Uh, and uh, uh, and stockholders, and uh, really at the um, uh, you know at, at the expense of the large masses in society. <laughs> Facebook is a perfect example where there is absolutely no uh, compunction of, of of you know having people over the human. And there is this is absolutely exists. For all the things that Mira said and 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 more, um, but there are um, so there are these technical issues uh, with regards to uh, safety, with regards to, uh, and the risk that we really have to look for. I do want to, however, point out the possibilities that we need to work harder on. Given that a person doesn't have all the means doesn't have all the uh, healthcare access, for example, if we take that example, or education access. Do we provide them something that is not as good as the world's best class healthcare or world's best education compared to not having anything? So, you know, think of that as in a triaging mode or something. I think that um, well-meaning, uh, you know, non-profits, uh, you know, uh, organizations need to get engaged in using the technology to make, um, to reduce the disparity and to make this, um, uh, you know, to give some tools for people to come up, bootstrap and, 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 and advance in that way. So in, the, in spite of a variety of challenges of safety and other others, uh, it's just like giving access to internet is a great boon for education for a child in rural India uh, to the extent that that access is still available. I think we need to uh, make this uh, technology uh, available to people who can, uh, you know, bootstrap themselves up or have access to things that otherwise they just don't have any access to. Laura, you have a very unique perspective here because you are actually dealing with physical robots in mm -hmm. the classrooms, right? So what are you worried about in this case? So many things, <laughs> so many things. But I think that, you know, Bryant made a really great point in the very beginning when he said, you know, you, you look at trust in terms of the company because it is a, there are so many design decisions that you make from the very get go that if you are committed to protecting the users and the customers that you're serving from the very beginning, it's baked into the process, into the culture, into the product development, and eventually into the deployment of that product into the marketplace. So I, I think, you know, it's, we worry about hardware safety. We, you know, our product has gone through rigorous ASTM testing, it's toy testing, it has to survive, you know, six foot drops, and it has to, it has to make sure that any, any kind of physical damage isn't going to, um, you know, risk injury for a, for a student or a child that may be using it, for example. So those are, those are some risks that are hardware related that are specific to, to our product. Um, in terms of its embodiment. But we also are a COPA compliant company, FERPA compliant, which means that the Child Online Protection and Privacy Act is something we take very seriously. We bake that into how the software manages user data, what we even collect from the very beginning. You know, we make those design decisions at the, at the very forefront of the development process because 
it matters to us that our customers will never get to that point where they say, well, you didn't really need to have that information. You didn't really need to store those images or that voice to, to accomplish what you say the, the, the product is, is meant for. So we're, you know, I think that it's a, it's a really, really driving question that I think more people should be asking about their companies. And one of the best things that we do as a company is we're as transparent as possible. We tell, you know, we tell you, you know, we'll say like, this is what we collect from the very get go. And, and it's a conversation that we have with our customers and the trust that we build over time, which is why we've had people come back and keep working with us and want to keep working with us because we build that trust over time. And it's like I said, as much as possible baked into the process and the product. Thanks, Laura. This human and design aspect of trust is really very, you know, important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Brian, uh, uh, automated lawyers, right? Uh, ah. Your your output is uh, very intangible. And also this is a very unregulated industry in contrast to healthcare, which is very regulated. Uh, or, or what do you think would be the issue in uh, legal support? Oh my goodness. Well, let me first say that, that Laura, my heart just sank a minute ago because you have absolutely adorable robots and you were <laughs> describing the six foot fall test. And now I'm picturing a giant torture chamber for your cute robots where you just do <laughs> horrible things to them in the interest of safety. And, and I just, I had to get that image out of my head um, because they're so cute. Um, so law is, is, is actually really regulated in the narrow sense, right? Only lawyers can practice law narrowly defined. It's, it's self-regulated in a lot of ways, um, uh, but it's, it's tightly regulated within that. So there are kind of the, the outer extent of law, and that's where a lot of these issues are arising. What counts as the practice of law or not? What counts as providing legal advice or legal services? Uh, and this is a, a real challenge for the profession. Um, if I could, if I could abstract it a little bit more, I, I think that there are, are a few challenges that apply in multiple domains, including law. Um, the first is framing. Right? So how you ask a question can determine how someone answers it. If I ask you, do you want to give me $10? Your answer is going to be no way. If I say, do you want to give me $10 or do you want to give me $100? Your answer might be a little different. Um, and this can be overlooked in algorithmic design, both in how users ask questions and in how algorithms present choices. Right? In human act interactions, right, what isn't said can sometimes be as important as what's not said. Uh, and, and lawyers recognize this, I think doctors recognize this, we understand those dynamics that don't translate necessarily as well into, into some early designs of, of collaborative assistance. The second real risk is the one answer problem. So a joke about lawyers is that we answer every question with, well, it depends. <laughs> and then we'll give you a bunch of different answers. And how this translates into a collaborative assistant can be more difficult, where the focus is, what's the one best answer? What's the best rather than what are the range of answers that we might need? And then finally uh, is reliance or over-reliance. And this, this came up in, in our earlier discussion. Right. Something that works pretty well can actually be way more dangerous than something that works pretty poorly because people start thinking that they can rely on it more than they should. And that means what would be an annoyance can become a catastrophe when the thing doesn't do as somebody expected. And that's true whether we're talking about legal advice or any of the, I think, other domains. Okay. So uh, I want to thank the panelists for the prepared kind of questions. With the, with, the, with the spirit of uh, you providing advice to the technologists in the room, right, the scientists and the students, uh, I will uh, let you uh, share anything you have the guidance, like you want to share, as well as open it up for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask our panelists on what you heard, anything that you object to. So please feel free to ask any question. And uh, my panelists uh, talk about uh, you know, any guidance you have from what you have heard or seen today. I have one question to uh, Dr. Narsimhan. So uh, in the mental health chatbots that we, we are working on, so when we, 
so you also mentioned that there is a potential opportunity uh, where we can use the chatbot uh, in between the session or in between the doctor visits. So I believe in those times, people usually try to use when there is uh, when they usually need a help or something of that sort. Uh, so if the patient receives uh, a wrong, I wouldn't say a wrong, a something, a, a reply that they did not intend to receive, it can trigger them off. It can put them off. So how do we deal that? Because sometimes the patient do want to hear what they want to hear. And as uh, as a human, we can kind of sense what the patients do want to hear and give the reply accordingly. But as a chatbot, how can we handle that? Or how can we navigate so, that? So, so I think there are a couple of issues here. So one, I think what you know, what Dr. Shet kind of said, Kashik was presenting a lot about personalization. Right? How do we personalize that to kind of the individual patient? We're not there yet, mm -hmm. right? We're just kind of you know trying to get at the, the very high level here. So I think that's one. One is trustable. Right? Can you make it? Can the user kind of you know trust this chatbot? So that's the other issue that kind of you know, we're up against. Uh, and then there's one size fit all. Mm -hmm. So does every patient, can we give a chatbot to every patient? Or do we use our discretion to say, this patient would benefit from a chatbot versus this patient not? So if somebody who has a, a borderline personality disorder who's trying to slash her wrist or something like that, would that be an appropriate one? So, so I think it, it's at some level, we as humans also have to make those decisions. While we interact, we use technology, embrace technology, and work closely with technology. But I think those are still kind of decision points that we've st still not derived at. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's still a work in progress, is what I, I would couch it. We, we, for example, decided that we are not going to, uh, you know, educate the user chatbot or make the chatbot um, uh, for patients that would harm themselves. Mm -hmm. So the whole knowledge graph of mental health, the only the low uh, risk uh, areas, uh, anxiety and depression that we uh, have chosen to work in, but, you know, suicide or bipolar and other things, we are, this is physiotherapy, we are not going there right now at all. We need a lot more experience in this one and success before we even think about doing something beyond that. So, vast area, we choose the area which is uh, where routine health cognitive behavior therapy, uh, meditation, medical compliance would be helpful mm -hmm. and it will make, keep the patient well functioning, but avoid the uh, cases where uh, the you know, child's of risk can enter that part. So within the clinical part also we segment uh, areas. I think it's also important, I think uh, Bryant mentioned about kind of, you know, the mind, body, spirit connected with it physical, emotional health. Uh, so I think it's, we cannot kind of just look at it in silos. Very often in health, we have kind of fragmented, right, level of care. So I think once you, you talked about uh, diet, the importance, diet plays a role across the board. You know, a person with depression and diabetes, diet does play a role. So, so, so to me, it's like, how do we bring this together and then figure out, okay, well, it's important for the, for the, the collaborative assistant to address depressive symptoms, but there are other aspects and dimensions too that also do contribute. If you're depressed and you have diabetes, more than likely you're not going to be compliant with your uh, diabetes regimen or with your diet. So again, kind of what came first, the chicken or the egg? How do we make that happen? But I think it needs to, it really begs a very, uh, an approach where it needs to kind of be input from a transdisciplinary team, whether you as kind of, you know, the technology experts, we as healthcare experts, and again, within healthcare, there are so many, right? You have the diabetologist, the endocrinologist, we have psychiatrists, you have primary care. How do we all come together to kind of have that well-informed decision that goes into the creation of the collaborative assistance? I, I just have one follow-up question now that you mentioned that. It's going to cost you. <laughs> <laughs> so many questions. Uh, just one more. So uh, people with anxiety disorder also have uh, food and their uh, stomach issues as well. So is it something that that we can provide help through diet or is it totally dependent on anxiety? I think across the board, not just anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
the, uh, whether you pick depression, you pick schizophrenia, you pick any mental illness for that matter. So if you look at schizophrenia alone, the rates of that obesity, right, in that particular uh, group, it's two fold higher compared to the Should other we organize the food boxes right now Similarly, so that then they come back at, uh, depression, again, there is a higher risk for kind of you know, obesity or being overweight, uh, overeating, all of those. So clearly there is a value add for you to kind of consider maybe dietary health. We talk about lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We do talk about lifestyle, not just in, uh, as in terms of exercise, but also what do you incorporate into your diet? Mm -hmm. And that's why I said it really needs to be more of a holistic approach when you're addressing health uh, of an individual versus just a silo approach. Thank you. Uh, so, any last question? Uh, yes, Vignesh. I have a general question. I think it's a broad question. So, uh, India has collaborative assessment. Uh, how would uh, how would it uh, demonstrate that this collaborative assessment preferably uh, you could so, uh, if, it, if, if it is possible to uh, demonstrate uh, preferably of the collaborative assessment. Is it for everybody? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're asking about how to how to validate the trustability of it? The trust. To test the validity of it. The trust. The trust. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. How to communicate to the user that this collaborative assistant is trusted? It's trustworthy. Ah, be transparent. I mean, that's that builds trust. Be transparent because part of trust is it is, is sort of setting expectations know your problem space communicate know your problem space right and focus on that problem space well and and you know where there are areas that are gray be transparent that this is in beta mode or this is not you know this is in training mode that this because that transparency lets your users know they don't have this is not a hundred percent confident system yet but they're working towards it. So I think transparency is very important for building trust, especially in the development stages of any product. If you try to put it out there and say, hey, this is a great chatbot and you know, uh, just trust us, it works. Uh, that's, just a, that's just a recipe for disaster, right? It's going to fail somewhere, sometime, and someone could get hurt. So I think transparency is really important. And that can also lead to um, garnering some great followers that say, hey, this is cool. Like, this is, we're actually helping develop this product to make it better. So, so in medical field, we have consent form, right? We don't do a great job, but we need to do a much better job in, uh, uh, in giving the you know, uh, participant uh, risk uh, benefit risk analysis. Why do we need to collect this data for what benefit you want? You can say that we can provide this level of support if you don't, you can choose not to share this data with us. You could choose to uh, uh, prohibit us from uh, storing your data in historical data, uh, but then we can customize this thing. But allow us to customize, but we'll still protect the data in this particular way that anytime the data goes from here to cloud, it will be anonymized. That from the cloud, any, uh, you know, uh, but if even if they get their data, they won't be able to identify it. That kind of thing we have to do. We have to do that. Problem is that often uh, we want to quickly get the people using it, and that interaction that needs to happen to educate them as to this cost benefit doesn't often happen. It is too uh, high a burden uh, because the patient has to stay, you know, in the consent thing for a long period of time. That will let them make them think hard. I was wondering about the education bot that would scour the text from a textbook and provide answers. I I'm not sure if he's still Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm yeah. interested. Yes. So um, I was really curious because I was wondering if there could be some confidence score that could be delivered with that, right? Because a confidence score can at least give the user some, some sense of like, oh, this is a little shaky. I might need to go back and check this myself, right? Like this is 67% confident. I might want to go back into the text and read that myself. Right? So currently they don't. The system has that information. So the algorithms do have confidence code because they are in a statistical algorithm, but they don't provide because that's a complexity. And uh, people want it very easy 
uh, to use the things without complex things. But if they, did it wrong, if they, if they confided in it, then you've lost that user forever. It's yeah, but what happens is, yeah, what happens is that um, this would help good students, and the poor students would simply not, uh, you know, would get tuned up with any complex key you provide, and they are the ones that is really needs more help. So we are dealing with another example where, you know, you have this problem that people will be helped more, would require more engagement, and would require, you know better understanding of what the tool can help or not help and yet uh, they need to be provided the simplest easiest fastest way to you know <laughs> to drive the things you know I, I think i'd agree with both of them a lot of kind of brought up transparency that's very important right amit brought up the informed consenting processes like where is the confidential information going exactly so i think that helps build trust and i'll give you an analogy of that so when i kind of let's say i prescribe an antidepressant to an individual right so I, I start off by setting expectations, right? There's a possibility that this medication may not work for you. Here are the risks, here are the benefits. So similarly, that's how we need to, while it's still in beta testing, here are the kind of, you know, it may not work, right? That's what we are trying to look at. And then very often, if you, let's say you have a quality product that you're putting out, let's say we've developed a wonderful collaborative assistant for depression or for anxiety for that matter. Then what we do is what we often, the, the only way in which we are successful is not when we as providers say, oh, I vouch for it. That's important. That's one component. But it's also the peers, right? If one patient tells the other patient, hey, I use this, and this is truly beneficial. So having that peer group also speak for it. So it's more of a kind of, you know, a multi-pronged approach to kind of build that trust is, I think, very important. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm going to request that we end here. But uh, this should just be seen as the start of a new conversation, not the end of uh, it. So thank you all for participating in the first phase of uh, KC second. Okay. I look forward to having you again for the second phase, which would uh, be on February 11th next year. And uh, we do have a uh, lunch out here. So please join us over lunch and uh, thank you again. Just one moment though. That you guys uh, all join here. This is how it needs to be uh, for, for you know uh, building the community we want to have. Oh, thank, thank you. you. That's very kind. Thank you so much. Oh, I also get next time I will be going to uh, make AI as the uh, uh, so. Sure. Thank you, Brian, and you are missed here. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and for the outstanding discussion. Sure. Uh, <laughs> we are just wearing a virtual hat. Okay? And, for the, and for the traumatic experience you had of the of the robot being dropped, I'll give you pro bono trauma focus therapy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank it's you everyone for participating. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for, for participating. We are ending right now. Thanks. Thanks. Well, so nice to meet you in person. Same yeah. here. So, Great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, I have a company. Oh, nice. What is the name? It's Advisor. Uh, so uh, I did reverse to you. I I may come.